uh, down at the bottom, I'm a, I'm a programmer and a software architect and tester. So I really like to, to look at the practical side of software engineering. And OpenAI is one of those uh, practical sides on that. So I will do it most of my time. I will spend most of my time doing demos and showing you different uh, use cases for OpenAIs related to coding. Um, but before that, I want to give you a bit of a glimpse how this OpenAI and, and language embedding really works uh, on a theory basis, just so that you understand why things happen the way they happen. So without further ado, let me go into this. So uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm, I'm a professor in software engineering at, at University of Gothenburg and Chalmers. I uh, specialize in uh, machine learning and uh, its application in software engineering and also in intensive care units, where together with my colleagues, we're trying to solve problems of identifying uh, strokes in the coma patients and those kind of things. But I'm at the bottom, of course, a, a programmer and architect, so I love talking code and, and uh, looking at those practical aspects of programming rather than the use of programming in other contexts. So today, what I will do is I, I will talk a bit about this open AI, which is a, the next cool thing that a lot of people in machine learning community have been talking about. Uh, I will talk a bit why this is so hyped and uh, I will also go in, a bit into theory of language embeddings and, and understanding vectors and matrices that are behind uh, understanding of, of language um, and programming languages by OpenAI and its uh, codex part. And then I will show a few, few demos about um, how to do code completion and requirement completion. And then I will also go with a bit more realistic example to go beyond the toy, toy uh, story examples and a bit into real code. Uh, I'm not, you're going to analyze your code, of course, uh, but I will analyze parts of the code from the Linux kernel with, I would say, is an industrial grade code. So, without further ado, what, why are we talking about OpenAI today? Well, OpenAI, uh, uh, as a company, of course, is is uh, the one that is founded by Elon Musk to provide a widespread of open AI, of AI tools to community. But there are two things that are really good about this OpenAI initiative. One is that they actually put a lot of resources in pre-training models. So what they provide is they don't provide frameworks like TensorFlow or PyTorch, for example, like Google does, but they provide ready-trained models, a bit like Microsoft does. Now, not only any kind of models, but also, but they focus on models that are related to natural language processing tasks and on uh, programming tasks. So some of you have probably heard about GitHub Copilot, uh, which is on a technical preview version now, which is a tool that is supposed to complement your code while, you drive, while you're writing. Um, I haven't had access to that yet. I'm, I'm on a waiting list. I hope that I will use it, but it's based on a GPT-3 model. And GPT-3 model is the actual machine learning model used in OpenAI to solve different tasks. Uh, it, it's trained on a uh, huge amount of vocabulary from the uh, internet, but also from GitHub. And uh, why this is so hype is because it's something that's called the generative pre-trained transformer. So, so transformers are usually language models that are used for machine translating. Google Translate has been using that for a while. Now, generative pre-trained transformers are the models which are trained to complement different tasks. And now this GPT-3 as a model <clears throat> is special because it is supposed to be something that is called a zero shot or a few shot training. Now, what does that really mean? That means that in most cases, you don't have to train your model to solve a task for you. In a traditional machine learning algorithms like uh, random forest or, or neural networks, you have to prepare your data, you have to train your model, evaluate your model, and then you can use it for your tasks. Now, you don't have to do that with OpenAI. And of course, in a traditional machine learning, if you want to change a task, for example, instead of translating from uh, English to Swedish, uh, translate from English to German, you have to retrain it. 
the generative pre-trained transformer GPT-3 doesn't have those limitations. You don't have to do that. It, it understands the context much better than the usual language. Uh, it's been used successfully for many different things, but um, I will focus only on code tasks uh, for us. Now, it's also very important to understand that this model is a very big model, so you cannot really download it on your laptop and use it. You have to use it through the interface, so there is a JSON API uh, to that. Uh, in our research projects at the university, we have models that are trying to fix uh, problems with code, do some code repair tasks, which are already quite big and require big resources, but they only have like 2 million parameters. I think GPT-3 has uh, billions uh, of parameters. I don't remember the number uh, and I want to make it up, but but it's a it's, you know, few orders of magnitudes bigger than our model. And as I said, it's a, it's a one-shot learning. So the picture that you see is a, is a picture of a BERT uh, language model, which is a, a transformer model used for language translation. And uh, it can be used in many different things, but it has to be trained for every task. And we don't have to use that, do that for OpenAI. But all of these trans, translator models are based on the same principle of understanding language in a specific way. Now, how does this really work? How do they really understand the language? Well, of course, they don't understand the language, they understand the context. So in the heart of those models, there is something that's called word embeddings. Uh, and up on this, uh, on the top row, you can see a, a sentence or from, from, for example, code review could be, could be also a program code sentence. And then below, you see the set of vectors which describe each of those words in a specific way. Now, and then, these vectors by themselves, they don't have an absolute meaning. So, so the number minus 0 0.11 doesn't really mean anything uh, in the model. The vectors are essentially describing where on a multidimensional space that word uh, or, or sentence or whatever we use as a token is placed. So this is roughly how it looks. Uh, we, we can plot those vectors uh, uh, like that. Now I do use a very, very a huge simplification. I only use two dimensions over here. So, for example, for the word change uh, in the at the bottom, I see you see that I use only two uh, parameters: the one from the top and the one from the bottom. That doesn't have the the uh, meaning for the theory of that. It's just for the simplification for drawing us. But as you see here, I use vectors to represent each of those words, so to say. And as you see over here, by this representation, mean that, for example, the word instead is positioned much closer to the word to than it is positioned to the word this. Now, that also means that if I know those kind of things and I, if I understand words in terms of vectors, I could do some vector arithmetic on that. And the trick used behind the uh, codex and uh, all the transformative generators is that the mean, the placement of those words in those vectors have a meaning so that I can actually do the vector arithmetic. So in the essence, what I can do is I could, for instance, calculate the distance between different words. For instance, I could use here, I could calculate the distance between the word static and the word change and the word static and the word this. So as you see, uh, the word static is much, clo much uh, closer to the word this than it is to the word change. It's not in my picture, but uh, according to, to the distances, those words are much closer, so to say. Now, what does that mean that I could calculate the distance? Well, that means that I could, for example, start calculating what would the next word from the word that I'm using be in a specific in a specific token or in a specific sentence? I could also try to see whether this a specific word fits in a specific sentence or not. Maybe it should be replaced by by some other word. Why is that so important? Well, it is so important because we could use that theoretical 
method and theoretical model for such tasks as automated program writing, also programming, or we could use that to repair programs, which I'm going to talk about today. Uh, we could also use it to, for example, complement requirements, which I will also give a very, very uh, brief example of. Now, what does that mean for us as programmers? Well, if we look at the theoretical side of that, we would say that, OK, this is a problem for us as programmers, because if artificial intelligence and codecs can write code for us, then why are we needed? Um, but I will show you that we are still going to be needed. But the challenge over here is that at the state of the art today, those transformative models are very good. And they are good to the extent that they can actually fool someone who is not the programmer, that they can provide a good program. In most cases, those, um, those transformation tasks or programming tasks, they could provide a program which will compile and actually provide the result. But in most cases, it's not going to pass the test. Not because the test is wrong, but because it doesn't understand the context and the meaning of certain things. And I will demo that in a minute. But before I demo that, I would also say that, like to say that now that we know how to work with vectors and how to work with, with those, and we could use synonyms, syn similarities, and, and this vector arithmetic, even though Codex and OpenAI doesn't understand natural language, they understand only vectors, because the vectors are positioned in a specific way, we could actually infer certain things. For example, you have two, two instances. One instance is um, the first sentence. When we say function and variables minus return, it will tell us that this model, that this vector is very close to the vector describing the word void. And as a programmer, you would say that, OK, if you have a function that doesn't have a variable, that has variables but doesn't have a return value, the return type should probably be a void. And so on and so on. So we can do those kind of arithmetic. And the whole idea of code completion task and code repair tasks is based on using that kind of arithmetic. So AI tries to find the, the right spot. Now, this diagram I showed you, the vectors, they, they look very nice when I when I show you that for like three words. But this is how this vector space looks like for, for the Linux kernel. Now, as you see, the majority of the words and lines and tokens are all over the place in between, very close to one another. But I would like you to take a look at two places. So, so one at the top, where we have the 0x000. Those of you who now see will directly say it's a null pointer. Uh, only described as a zero. And then, probably shouldn't be used that like that. It should be used in uh, as a null, uh, nil instead. But also, I would like you to take a look at the very bottom where I put the, in green the types. So you can see that the types somehow are very close to one another, right? Uh, they are not on top of one another, but they are very close to one another. And they are very far away from, from words like software or terms at the top, uh, which don't have any meaning, uh, which probably come from licenses used in different uh, modules in Linux kernel. So that means that if we run this uh, vector embedding on, on our code, it learns certain type of dependencies with this code. Uh, and the more code we provide, the better those dependencies are going to be, and the more correct inferences we're going to use in our software. Now, the time is for, for me to now switch to the demo. So uh, uh, let's do that. Let, let me switch the, um, the windows. So I hope you can see my browser now. Um, as I said, OpenAI has a number of different interfaces. I, I will start with a very simple interface, which is a web interface, uh, which is a wrapper around the JSON API. So how we interact with this kind of models is that we provide it with uh, certain instructions, what we want it to do, and then uh, it will, should provide us uh, with, uh, with a response. So um, this is an example that is, is a sort of crown example from, um, crown example from OpenAI. 
Um, we could uh, tell the program to create a list of first names. Uh, we could uh, press generate and we see what the program will generate over here. Um, and as you see, it, it uh, since I used uh, Python as um, Python as a programming language or, or as a comment style, um, uh, it started providing in, in uh, Python, but I only gave him uh, ask for 64 tokens, so so it didn't generate the entire program. Uh, if I ask for more tokens, it will generate uh, more programs, so to say. And as you see. I ask it to create a list of file, first names, last names, combine them randomly, and then I would say, give me 100 names. So it works very well. Now, that's a crown example. Let's see if it really understands what I'm trying to do. So let, let's see if we check which names are female. Um, I pre-prepared those examples before, so I, I'm reading from my script on the site, in case you wonder. Uh, so let's see if it generates something. Well, uh, yeah, so you see it, it's added suddenly one more uh, piece of code, a list of female names. And then for some reason, it, the, the OpenAI sort of found the code that uh, checking if a female name contains an A uh, or if a name contains full names, uh, contains an A, then it's a female name. So it does something. Whether that is correct or incorrect, well, it depends very much on this particular data set. And this is one of the things that I mentioned at the beginning that it could very easily fool us into having a program that makes sense, but maybe necess not necessarily fulfill all the requirements that we want to do. Now let's see, but this is a Python, right? Let's see, let's check something that um, I mentioned before. So. I told you that this is a, a tool that is so-called a zero shot learning. So let me change the style of commands to a C and write in C. Let's see if it can do it in C for me. Um, and as you see, it starts doing something. So the beginning it looks like a C. Um, I mean, it, it includes standard C libraries, except for IO Stream, which you probably started to suspect that it's maybe not really C, but C++. And you would say that, OK, it's namespace that they don't exist in C, right? It's a C++ kind of thing. And then templates also don't exist, and standard template, template library doesn't exist in C, right? Uh, so it does it. And again, I have a code that was mo most probably compile in, in Visual Studio or, or some other compiler um, in C++. Could even fool the compiler that it's a C in uh, certain cases. A and it does roughly what I'm asking it to do, right? Um, or does it? Well, if we start looking at the code now, in Python, the function checking for the name, if a name was female was based on the fact if a female's name contains or if a name contains a small letter a now um, this one actually only recognizes you uh, as a name and uh, nothing else the same so it's a bit of a different program and that's one of the things that i think that why i think that uh, this technology has a huge potential but it's not a technology that's going to replace us programmers or designers so I will get back to that a uh, few times, but how I see this technology for now is that it's very good for an experienced programmer to get a very quick solution or very quick help in the programming tasks, but it's probably not going to be a, a replacement for that particular task. So um, maybe, we do another uh, thing before I before we go to the to the other type of demo. So this kind of program, since OpenAI or Codex was trained on GitHub uh, GitHub repositories, it contains a lot of code from GitHub, right? So those kind of tasks, they quite often in GitHub, checking the names, uh, random generation of uh, things, and so on. 
So I was also thinking, how about if I go to uh, Rosetta Code, which is a repository of, of different type of um, programming pro problems in different programming languages, and take one of the one of the algorithms that they use. So for example, checking a prime number, uh, just for the sake of it, and see what, what OpenAI will generate. Now, <clears throat> as you see over here, it actually doesn't generate that uh, that bad code, so to say, right? I mean, it generates a function to check if a number is prime, and that function actually makes a lot of sense. I mean, if it divides something, uh, if it's two, if it divides by two, then it's definitely not a prime. Uh, but then it also, you know, checks uh, a specific check for how much, how many numbers it has to iterate over, and then checks if the number is prime or not, so to say. Um, I mean, it's a pretty standard code. It's a pretty good code. So, so you could actually fool an experienced programmer um, into having this as a code. So, so far, so good. But um, I'm a programmer, so so okay. I, I, I kind of creative work of actually uh, working with programs. It's not something that I would like AI to do for me. So let's think about AI as a as a copilot for me, I mean, just like a GitHub copilot. How about if we um, if we start thinking about um, the programming code as a, as a task to repair. So let's see if OpenAI can can actually help me program. And to demonstrate that, I'm not going to use the playground, which is the uh, the uh, web interface. I will actually use a Python code. So I'm having a my uh, Jupyter notebook programming uh, environment set up. And what I will do is I will just ask OpenAI to fix certain things, yeah, and I will take it from there. So as you see. In order to communicate with that, I need a specific key, and that's something that you can get once you get the account and open AI. And after that, you can just start communicating with open AI very, very easily. So I'll just check what if it actually fix. Yes. So what I would like to do is I would like to do my first stack to say, how about asking Codex to fix a piece of code for me, right? So I'm asking the code to say, fix this code, import panda as PD. Whereas, I, as you see, I, I have double M in this word. So there is a simple mistake over here. Now, now it actually fixed this code. It actually complemented that with uh, another code. Now, why didn't it stop after the first uh, row? Well, since I told I gave it a command to fix this code. I didn't really tell it to what kind of fix I would like to apply. And as I mentioned at the beginning, it works on vectors. So it doesn't understand the words, it understands vectors. And in this case, it understood that I'm asking it to fix or complement this code. So it has been looking for vectors that are similar to these words, but are that it knew that it was that they were correct from GitHub. So it found to found a vector or two, which said that import pandas as PD and import NumPy as NPM. And of course, if you, if you are data scientists or work a bit with, with Python, you, you know that those libraries are very often used together, so to say. So it didn't make anything uh, bad. It actually added something that's good. And of course, you know, as you see, it could fix my code. Now let's see if it can handle two mistakes in one line. So here I'm actually asking the code to fix two mistakes, uh, one a letter and then into pandas, but Pandora um, as that. And as you see, it did found the word Pandora in its dictionary somewhere. So it didn't find this as a mistake uh, on that. It actually provided me with that code. But that's Python. How about, let's see, a bit more a strange mistake, right? How about um, asking it to fix the code in C? So I'm, I'm asking it to fix this code. And um, 
see what I get. Oh, I only got uh, two tokens, but it doesn't really matter. So I'm asking it to, to have, uh, have those mistakes fixed. And as you see, it started to fix the mistake. Well, first of all, it found out that most people, when they write C programs in uh, uh, GitHub, they use STD stdio.h, not just standard. And I also start the uh, main as a, as a parameterized function, not the function with the void as I did over here. Um, so, so let's see uh, what we do a bit more. Now, we only got a few tokens because it has a standard response length. Now we am adding more parameters, saying that give me more tokens than, than you usually do. And um, Let's see what it uh, gives me. Um, I'm doing that live so it communicates with uh, with OpenAI. And as you see now, it, it has started fixing that code, but I gave it the wrong stop token, so generated it uh, until it reached max token, so to say. So what did it generate? Now you see my signature function was changed, and then return type was uh, added over here, so to say. So OK, it could actually fix uh, some simple code. What it can also do is can, can translate from one code to another. So for example, we could translate from uh, C to Python. Uh, we could see what that is going to look like. Oh yeah, right, uh, response. Well, as you see, could actually transform C to Python. Um, now, one thing that I would like you to also take a look at is that, as you see, I'm not retraining the model for new tasks. I'm giving it commands to do some things for me. And that is what I said, something that's called the zero shot or few shot learning. Uh, we could try with any, uh, any kind of commands, uh, whatever we want, but um, yeah, uh, uh, I stick to my demos, let's say, for today. Good. So, uh, I could go on with more examples in this way. Um, the content is, uh, or the summary of that, is that um, I will always get a, a lot of code. Uh, sometimes this code is better, sometimes it's worse. In most cases, it will uh, compile if I give it enough tokens and, uh, and uh, so on. It will compile in most programming languages, um, but in most cases, I, as a, as a programmer, have to revisit that code to understand uh, what's behind, what's actually being generated. Uh, what it can also do is, can, for example, take a piece of comment and try to see if it can generate a description for that. So, so this is the code that I've taken from Rosetta Code, which is generating uh, uh, in this, uh, or calculating the factorial numbers. So I will ask it to, to summarize that, right? So I'm asking it uh, over here, summarize this code. Uh, yeah, Let's see what it uh, returns. Uh, yeah, and as you see, it actually generated some sort of description over here at the top, what it does. And, you know, it actually does understand that it it's calculating the factorial number. Uh, something that is uh, actually true for that. But it also started generating some... Uh, okay. Um, disappeared there for a moment. Am I back? Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, you're back. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Uh, so, so it can actually do quite many things, this, this open AI. Uh, it could actually help me uh, you know, write a function that will tokenize a, a given string and so on, fix problems and uh, those kind of things. But as you see, those tasks are the tasks that you know I don't even give to my students because they are just too simple for them. So how about looking at this open AI a bit more thoroughly? So let's do like this. Let's take a look at how open AI can re fix the code that's been written somewhere else. So, so far I have used the code that is, you know, so popular that it probably exists somewhere on GitHub. Now I've um, used the code that I added to GitHub just a few days ago, 
So I'm pretty sure that OpenAI doesn't know this code yet. And what I did in this simple experiment is that I've uh, taken a Python code, a, a file that contains about 7,000 lines of code, and then I have uh, randomly picked 10 lines of code from that file, and I will do some modifications, see some errors, and I will ask uh, OpenAI, the codex, to fix those errors for me. Uh, I'll not run, I will not run the entire thing at the moment. I will only show you a few things, right? So this is the kind of uh, code that I have taken from that. So I, some are empty lines, some are lines that uh, import something, some are lines that are signatures, random kind of thing. And if I ask it, uh, um, this is a random selection of those, then I could, what I will, what I would, have, what I've done is that I've seeded problems in there. So I've taken uh, for every line, just change one character. So kind of simulate the problem that I showed you before uh, when I wrote, when I've written import with double M uh, on that. And see in how many cases <laughs> the, the open AI can actually fix that mistake. And now you see it's not a simple code. It's actually code that is written uh, for this particular, for a particular task. It's not uh, so available on GitHub for so long. And it's, um, it's not printing characters as it was before. And then in the second exercise, I've changed, made a lot, another change. So I was thinking, how about if instead of making a mistake in a simple word, like a, like a spelling mistake or, you know, writing the wrong character, which happens, how about if I sort of see if it can fix a broken keyword? So I've looked for keywords in any line, and in, in the lines that has keywords, I've changed the keyword to random another keyword uh, in Python. Uh, and I've asked the AI to do that for me. And now this is roughly what I'm what I'm getting, so to say, right? So you could see here my original line that I was the line with an else. Uh, what I modified is that I added a letter U at the beginning, a random letter, and OpenAI actually, this is the response from OpenAI, as you see. So in this case, the response and what the original mistake, the original mistake and the original line was, are very, very, very far away. So, so that is bigger pro, uh, a big issue, so to say, right? Um, then in this particular case, a second line, I took, um, as you see, this line, added an F at the beginning, uh, and then I got almost the same line, but with a different token class. And I will not go through all of that, uh, those examples in the, uh, uh, over here. Okay, uh, then what I have later on is I've actually compared how far away those, uh, those lines are from, uh, from one another. What I did over here is that I actually have asked OpenAI to do the same thing, but for those lines of code where I actually changed one keyword. So as you see in the first example, I had an uh, else if statement, and I changed the word else if to finally, and then what I got was fix this code as a response. Uh, in the second example, Actually, maybe it was a bit back, uh, better. Uh, so I had this line and it has the word model.outputs and I changed to model assert. So, so actually Dell uh, keyword was uh, caught over here. But then OpenAI didn't find any mistake over here, right? Could be because the word model and model and the word assert, no assert, happen to be somewhere in the open a, in the GitHub repository and they're probably equally frequent. So this is my uh, Python examples. I uh, did exactly the same thing with uh, C code, but for the C code, let me open up uh, this one. I will not go through uh, the method. I did exactly the same thing. But for the C code, what I did, what I actually took one file from a Linux kernel. So this auto group uh, file, it's, it's part of the scheduler module in the kernel and it's responsible for grouping um, 
grouping uh, threats and processes which are similar to minimize the number of times that the processor changes uh, context. So it's a very, very low level function. But because it's low level, it calls a, it's written in C, it contains pure C kind of things. Even open up, I think, this one and, and see what that looks like. So as you see, this is a typical C kind of program. There is no import pandas or, or um, things like that, no printing out uh, messages. This is yeah, roughly as hardcore uh, C as you can uh, probably get in industrial context. So I did the same exercise. And if I look at the results, I could see, so the first part is when I only con corrected the, or changed one letter. And as you see here, I changed the letter W instead of underscore. I got to something completely, completely different. In the second example, I took uh, actually an empty line even, and then added the letter U, and then it complemented that with something completely random. Uh, and I did the same example as I did with Python, but uh, replacing the C, um, C keywords over here. And I could go on for that with many, many, many other programming languages or, or modules, but I would like to show you the statistics of what it actually means later on. So how about uh, comparing the real similarity, so to say. Now, I've um, collected 10 examples from, from both uh, C and uh, from Python, both with uh, modifying one letter and modifying the modifying the entire keyword. And I compared that to how far away the, the correction was from, uh, from the mistake, so to say, uh, by itself. And I used two different, um, two different measurements. Uh, in this particular diagram, what you see is the the scatter plot of differences between the modified line of code and the result or the corrected line of code by code X measured in Levenstein distance, which is a distance measuring how many letters I have to change from one string so that it looks like another string. So ideally, since I've changed one letter, my response should be a corrected letter. So the difference between the changed, uh, the distance between the changed line of code and corrected line of code should be one. So, so it should be over here, right? And as you see over here, that happens only in one case. In, in the second case, as you see, uh, that letter is, is a bit farther away, right? The tokenizer class was changing token class uh, in that particular example. But the farther those lines are from this point, the worse the suggestion gets. And as you see, the suggestions are all over the place. Uh, for example, sometimes you have, like in the middle over here, you have the case equals is, and then it was replaced by a comment in, in uh, Python, I think this is the case. Uh, I could also do the same thing for another type of distance. Now, Yarrow distance is, is um, a distance which is measured in an absolute scale between zero to one. I won't go into details of those measurements, so to say. But as you see, the idea would be the same, that zero is the closest what you can get, so to say, and the closest what you should be. So all of those all of these mistakes should be over here if OpenAI was good enough for, for this mistake. So as you see, the suggestions I'm getting are not that great. Now, um, I could do the same with the Python code. As you see, the Python code, it's actually the same uh, file. Uh, why wasn't this one here? Yeah. So I actually have the same file over here, but it's the same thing for for um, for uh, Python and for uh, C code uh, all over the place. So these diagrams basically show you that even in in five years from now, we as programmers will have a job, 
because AI can provide us with a code, but the code that it provides us in most cases is not the code that should be in that particular place. That also means that if you're using this kind of tools in your software, in your software development processes even, you should be very careful about trusting the results and you should not take them for granted. You should only use them as suggestions for, uh, for your designers, not as the, uh, the ground truth later on uh, for that. Good, so uh, with that, I think I will finish up my demo. Um, yeah, we could also do requirement specification analysis if you want to, <clears throat> but I would rather open up for demos, uh, for questions uh, before we part. So, um, what I'm going to do with, uh, with this technology in the spring right now is that uh, I will test it on different contexts. I have a company, Grundfos, which is uh, um, collaborating with us in Software Center, and we're going to use that to find security vulnerabilities in their code. Also, together with, um, with uh, some of the colleagues at, um, at Ericsson, we'll try to use that to analyze requirement specifications and to try to see if we can uh, at least evaluate how good or bad OpenAI is in understanding requirements as a concept, so to say. Since it's a zero-shot learning, we should be able to, to do that. And then what I will also do if, for uh, yet another company is that I will try to do something that's called the code review part, where I will try to ask AI to create a description of a review comment for a code that I know has been flagged in the get it or GitHub as uh, problematic by someone and see how far away that kind of comment is from the actual comment generated by, by a human reviewer to be able to understand if we can essentially uh, replace some of the auto um, manual work of code review tasks to open AI and this kind of tools. So that's all from my side.